You're listening to the Hello Awesome Podcast, and this is episode number 76. Welcome back to season four, my friends. We are here with another amazing conversation as we continue on with the Testify series. I hope you guys really enjoyed listening to Shalani's story last week. If you haven't already, you can pause this and go back and listen to episode 75. It was incredible. Today on the podcast, I'm sharing with you a conversation with Malika Richardson. She is a traveling nurse and she has opened up about her testimony on how God truly brought her home. From dealing with abuse as a child to the tragic loss of her grandmother who was more like a mother to her to a really difficult car accident that left her questioning what God was even doing with her life. If you ever struggled with the pull of the world and the pull of the church and feeling like you're right in the middle and not sure what to do, this episode is for you. Malika shares her journey with just a heartfelt joy and I truly love her spirit and I know you will too. So let's get right into this amazing story. This is episode number 76, Better Days Are Ahead with Malika Richardson. Hey guys, I'm JC. Are you ready for real conversations about faith, business, and life? Me too. This is the Hello Awesome Podcast, where I bring forth topics and truthful insights that will encourage you to make intentional choices and pursue God with your whole heart. Are you ready to say hello to the awesome blessings that God has for you? All right, let's do this. Just a quick note about this new series called Testify. It does contain adult content and will not be suitable for young children. So if you have young children around, I suggest that you listen to this on some headphones, on some earbuds, so that their little ears can stay pure and can stay innocent. Thank you for understanding. Summer is upon us and what better way to celebrate than with some sweet deals. I have an amazing group of business ladies who have sponsored the podcast and they have a treat just for Hello Awesome listeners. My friend Chantel, a two-time podcast guest, runs the very successful modest fashion clothing brand, Nuggles. Aiming to always provide beautiful, comfortable, and affordable apparel, Nuggles desires every lady to embrace modesty with style. You don't have to break the bank or sacrifice that morning latte when you shop with Nuggles. In fact, Hello Awesome listeners can use the exclusive 10% off discount code by using Hello Awesome 10 during checkout. Head to nuggles.us to browse their full collection today. Again, that's N U G G L E S dot US to shop high quality products to add to your modest wardrobe right now. Do you find yourself struggling to find a durable scrunchie that's both functional and cute? Seriously, look no further than So Vita. Guys, I am not lying when I say that I use Lucy's scrunchies every single day and my hair reaches behind my knees. So Vita is a handmade shop with beautiful and fun scrunchies, headbands, and more. Use coupon code PODCAST for 10% off your order right now at SoVita.com. That's S-E-W-V-I-D-A.com. Go grab a few goodies this summer and keep your hair off your neck with style. Be sure to also follow Lucy on Instagram at Sovita. Are you looking for classic modest pieces for your summer wardrobe? My girl Mandy over at Blue Thistle Taylor has timeless dresses, skirts, and handbags. Last year, it was such a treat to meet Mandy during general conference in Indiana, and I truly feel like we're soul sisters. I love her passion for simplistic modesty, and you will too. Just use our special code HelloAwesome for 20% off your order on BlueThistleTailor.com. That's B-L-U-T-H-I-S-T-L-E-T-A-I-L-L-U-E-R.com. Also give her a follow on Instagram at BlueThistleTailor. I don't know about you, but I struggle to find quality skincare products with simple ingredients that don't irritate my skin, especially in these hot summer months. While Rachel over at Oneness Essentials makes handmade soap and body products that not only look and smell beautiful, 
but they're perfect for sensitive skin like mine. I seriously can't wait to try her Cocoa Cream Lotion. It sounds like it smells amazing. Use code HelloAwesome for 15% off your order when you shop at onenesssoapbiz.com. That's O-N-E-N-E-S-S-S-O-A-P-B-I-Z.com. Make sure to also follow Oneness Soap Biz on Instagram for gorgeous product photos and updated business info. So when I think of summer, I think of hanging out by the shore and strolling along little shops, browsing at the adorable clothing that I just can't afford. Can you relate? Well, you don't have to worry about that with Dress Like an Angel. Felicia is a pastor's wife and mama of two beautiful daughters who has been selling clothing for 30 years now. Wow, this woman of God is the ultimate mama boss. Felicia's shop, Dress Like an Angel, features stunning dresses, skirts, extenders, layered tops, and so much more in a variety of styles while highlighting the beauty of modesty. She even carries items for young girls like her best-selling lace tights. If you live near Starks, Louisiana, stop by their brick and mortar store that's filled with adorable, gorgeous clothing. Or use our exclusive discount code HelloAwesome for 10% off your order at dresslikeanangel.com. Keep up with their huge inventory selection and future sales by following Dress Like an Angel on Instagram. Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. This season is amazing already. I know I felt the Lord move on my heart to turn the spotlight on testimonies and feature incredible stories of redemption that is unique to each guest. And today I'm so very excited to welcome Malika Richardson to the podcast. Malika, thank you so much for just taking time to be with us and to share your story. I want you to just share with us who you are and what you do. Hi, so I'm Malika, as JC just told you all. I'm 27. I will be 28 in six days. Right now, I am a traveling nurse, which I love nursing and traveling nursing. I love that so much more because there's so much for me to see, so many new places for me to go, so many new people for me to meet. And in the midst of me doing this, I get to visit so many different churches and get involved with so many different people that I share the same mindset with when it comes to Christ and all of that. So it's been an amazing adventure so far. And that's me. That's awesome. So um, I don't have this on my on my questions list, but I want to know how long have you done nursing? I have been a nurse for three and a half years and no four. And I've been a traveling nurse for two years in August. Wow, that's amazing. Well, congratulations on that. Sounds like you really do have your dream job. Thank you. I do. I really love it. So I really wanted to uh, to jump in because I know when we start sharing our stories, um, it can get lengthy because we're talking yes. about what God has done in our lives and he's done so, so much for all of us. But I really wanted you to get the spotlight today because I feel like your story is very unique and different. And um, you really do have a powerful testimony. We shared back and forth on Instagram, you know, DMing each other. Uh, and, and then you sent me an email uh, detailing your testimony. And I really appreciate that. Um, but I wanted to really talk about really the beginning. Can you start with um, maybe how it all started? I, I know you mentioned to me before um, off the podcast that your mother was pregnant with you really young. Is that correct? Yes, she got pregnant with me when she was about 17, so she was still in high school, and she was young, so majority of the time, I was with my grandmother. She still lived with my grandmother because mm -hmm. she was in high school, but my grandmother mostly raised me, so my biological mom, I saw her more as a sister and my grandmother as my mom. That actually makes a lot of sense, and I've seen that played out in a lot of different lives, um, a lot of different people that I know. So what was your, what was your home life like in the beginning? Did you, did you go to church when you were young? How, how was that all kind of, um, how did that all play out? So 
growing up with my granny, she was Southern Baptist. So we went to a Baptist church, you know, I was in the choir, I was on a praise team. Like we were involved in different things. I was like in the little kids ushering ministry. My grandmother was very involved with the church. So from a young age, I went to church. Like I was exposed to church. I knew who God was. I knew what the Holy Ghost was, but I will say when I was little, I always thought like, oh, the Holy Ghost is for old people. So when I'm old, that's mm-hmm. when I'll get it. But that yeah. changed. <laughs> but no, I grew up going to church and being involved in church, but a Baptist church. And as I got older, I became apostolic Pentecostal. Mm-hmm. It's actually really cute that you said that because my my sons say the same thing. When I get old, <laughs> I'll get the Holy Ghost. And yes. they're seven and four, so it's like time is so abstract when you're a kid. Yes. Yeah, so, so th- it sounds like your grandmother really laid that foundation for you as far as knowing about God and about just being involved in church and ministry and things like that. Yes, my granny was a great role model for me. I love her and she was like literally like my knight in shining armor the perfect person in my eyes she raised me you know there was nothing that my grandmother could do wrong to me um and I just always remember as a little kid telling her like when I'm older I'm gonna be rich and you can live with me forever I'll take care of you you know like that was my person that I just knew was going to be my forever. But unfortunately, my forever got cut a little short. In 2008, she like unexpectedly passed away. I was 15. So Mm. then I felt like my world just crashed. Like my person left me, my granny left me. I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And I was young. So it was just like, I was hurt, you know, like, why like why my granny that was my safety person that was my person that took care of me that was all I had I felt like so it was that was a very hard time losing her because I had so many plans for our life right right and how old were you because like I said I, I remember reading your your testimony um in the email you sent me How old were you when you were first exposed to abuse at home? I was probably when I like really started to realize it, I was around six. So my, I primarily lived, I primarily lived with my grandmother and my biological mom. She had her own place and I had, she had another son, which is my half brother he was probably three and a half years old. So he stayed with her full time and I stayed with my granny full time, but I would go and visit them. And she got married. She married my brother's father and he was abusive. So when I would go visit them, that's when I would see it. You know, like I would Mm -hmm. hear him beating my mom or see him beating her in front of us. And then if she had to go to work and I was there, then I would be the product of the abuse. Like, Mm -hmm for dumb things for no reason at all. And I understand disciplining a child, but there's a difference between disciplining and beating. And I would get beat. And majority of the time it was because he didn't like me. Like he would tell me all the time that he didn't like me because I wasn't his child, which as a kid is hard for you to understand. Even as an adult, it's still hard for you to understand because I would not mistreat somebody else's child because they're not my child, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's still just hard to understand, but there are some things that aren't to be understood. So that's when I was exposed to it, but I still went back and forth between my granny. Like I stayed with my grandmother and then I would go visit and stay some nights at my biological mother's house. And then that's when I was exposed to it. And then my grandmother moved back to Louisiana when I was in like fifth grade, going into sixth grade. And my biological mom didn't let me come with her. So I moved in with her and her husband full time. So then it was full time abuse. That's tough. And I can't, I, I can't even imagine. I mean, I'm a parent and yeah, we, you know, we feel some feelings, but I think there is a spirit behind that. I really do. Yeah. And I think um, 
I think there's something to be said with the enemy will use anyone to try and deter us from the calling of God. And um, I really wanted to, uh, to talk about when did you connect with your grandmother again after she moved? How old were you? So my grandmother moved to Louisiana and we were in Illinois, still in Illinois. My grandmother, all of her family is from Louisiana. We're all from here. So she came back here to help take care of her mother when she got sick. So we were in Illinois for a little bit. And then I would say like fifth and sixth grade was there for sure. And then in seventh grade, I was still there, but the abuse had got a lot worse. And my stepdad would try to like run over my biological mom with cars, like just do mm. all type of crazy things. So finally she had enough. And at this point she had three children by him. So he had some type of order to where she couldn't take his children out of the state of Illinois. So we just went far south in Illinois as we could. And we ended up living in a place called Carbondale, Illinois. And we lived in a women's shelter there for about a year. And then the women's shelter after the year, you know, they got us an apartment and we stayed there. My stepfather ended up finding us when we moved out the women's shelter and was in an apartment and came there, you know, he would stake out the place, break in a few times. We would call the cops. They never caught him. And then once he came and he had a gun and he was going to try to kill us and we like called the police nonstop and they came and caught him. So once he got caught for that with a loaded gun and all of that stuff, they lifted that protection order on his children and we got to move to Louisiana. So that's when mm -hmm. I got to reconnect back with my granny once we were able to leave the state of Illinois. That's got to be the most frightening thing as a child. I mean, yes. it's different when you see things in the movies, but when it's playing out in real life and, and I'm, you know, the first eight years of my life, I grew up in, in Hartford, Connecticut, which is a, you know, the city here. And, and I didn't see things up close like that, but different things have happened or that I've witnessed or that I've had family members go through. And it's hard to recover from that. Yes, it is. Like the older I'm getting and the more that I talk to people, you know, my close people about things has helped a lot. And then I went to therapy, like in my younger years, I would say probably like eight or so years ago. And that helped. So I just recently started going to therapy again because I do from my past and my past life, I do deal with depression and anxiety so I do go to therapy and my best friends are also, I call them my therapists too. They help me through a lot. And then my mm -hmm. mom, which my adoptive mom is very great and my adopted dad also. So I talk to them about a lot of stuff. So for me, talking to my close people and being able to confide in them helps. Like it doesn't erase the past and, you know, some parts are still hurt and dark there, but talking with people definitely does help ease up that pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that because I think that's important for listeners to know is if there's something that's really bothering you and you feel like you don't have somebody to talk to, then seek out a counselor, seek out somebody who you trust it, especially in the church or, you know, an elder, uh, a youth pastor, somebody, because it's not, it's not good to hold that inside. You kind of have to you let know, it out. Let yes. it out. Because if we don't talk about it, it's going to come out in different ways. Yes. And the ways that it will come out mm -hmm. might not be healthy or good for you or others around you. So talking about it definitely does help. It releases any anger that you didn't know that you had built mm -hmm. up, like any tension, all of that. Like, I didn't used to be someone that would talk because I was always embarrassed, you know, or I didn't want people to think that I wanted them to feel sorry for me. And I didn't want to be a burden to other people. So I would just be like, oh, you know, okay, I can just talk to myself about it. Like, I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Just hold it in. But then the more I held it in, the more I felt like, oh, I don't have anybody. All I have is me. All I can trust is me. So talking to people is easy. And I mean, sometimes it still is hard. Like I still struggle with thinking I'm all I got I can only depend on me you know like okay. I have God but also on this earth like 
I just only can confide in myself. And my parents and my best friends remind me, like, no, you are not all you have. You also have us. You need to talk to us. Don't just hold stuff in and push us away because that's not helping anyone. It's not helping me at all. So talking about things really does help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I understand where you're coming from because I think those of us who have gone through hard times, I've obviously have gone through some hard times too, is you almost go into like survivor mode, like you're trying to survive and you're trying to be strong. So, so when you're trying to be strong, you're trying to be everything. (laughs) And you're, you're trying not to show your feelings because sometimes in society, they, they kind of make it as if our feelings make us weak. Yes. And, uh, and that's why I didn't share so much because then I was mm-hmm. like, oh, people are going to think I'm weak. Oh, people are going to think I want their sympathy. So yeah. I can't do that. I have to put on this brave face and smile and, you know, everything's going to be fine. But that's not how life works. No, <laughs> no. Well, tell me, tell me about what was it like when you realized that one of your teachers really cared so much about you and your situation that they actually wanted to invest in you and they wanted to bring you in as family okay it that was it was an amazing feeling and it's it's a funny backstory like my my teacher she was my teacher and now she is my mom so it's always like when I tell people like oh yeah this is my mom and then I'm like she used to be my Spanish teacher they're like what (laughs) Um, I love that (laughs) our story is kind of funny so I was not I wasn't a bad kid but I also was not a very quiet child like I talked a lot literally you can sit me next to anybody and I'm gonna make friends with them it could be the quietest kid in the class but I'm gonna be like you're gonna talk to me (laughs) you're gonna be my friend so (laughs) I was a very chatty kid in school always talking always getting fussed at for talking like stop talking I'm gonna move your seat and I'm like oh okay then I get to make a new friend (laughs) so um my mom didn't really care for me (laughs) when I was in our classroom but we connected because one day this is when MySpace was popular one of her students in the class asked like oh do you have MySpace and she was like no I don't know what MySpace is so I got this great idea I was like oh okay she doesn't know what MySpace is I'm gonna make her a MySpace page (laughs) so I went home that night and I made her a MySpace page and then I went to school the next day and I gave her the email and the password for the MySpace and I was like here you go now you have MySpace and she was like what and I was like oh I made you a MySpace so now you have my space. So then she was like, okay. So she got on and I had taken the time to add every single student in the class. Oh. Why not? I made her in my space. Awesome. <laughs> so, so I gave it to her and then she got on and checked it out. And she's like, oh, how did all of these students find me? You know? So then she figured out like, oh, you have to go out and send a friend request to the people. So then the next day in class, she was like, hey, I want to apologize because I have to delete all of you guys because I can't be friends with all my students on Facebook and I didn't send out that friend request. So if you got deleted, I don't want you guys to have any hard feelings, but I can't keep them in my space. So I, she kept me and one day, I think we were both on at the same time. You know, you can see a messenger. So I think I had messaged her and asked you know what was she doing and she said that she was eating dinner and she always ate healthy so I was like oh I bet you're eating something healthy I'm getting ready to make us something to eat as in me and my siblings and she asked me like oh what are you guys eating for dinner and I had said peanut butter and jelly sandwich so to her that's like a snack that's not like dinner and she was like Mm -hmm. oh as a snack and I was like no dinner because we were poor that's all we could afford and then she was like okay so one day you know she just started talking to me and I started like through my space, you know, talking to her about my life and everything that was going on. And she had just said, you know, like, if you guys ever need anything, I'm here. So one day she took us grocery shopping to get groceries. And it was very weird because here we are at Walmart and I'm like, somebody's going to see us. They're going to see me with my mm-hmm. teacher. And then they're going to be like, why is your teacher buying you groceries? You know, like, huh, yeah. this is weird. So I was like, okay, you know, trying to quickly go through Walmart, grabbing bread and stuff. And she was like, no, you can get other stuff. So then I was like, huh, okay. (laughs) So then just from there, like from MySpace, our relationship grew. And then I was, my grandmother was still alive when I met my Spanish teacher. And then my grandmother ended up passing away. So things got hard. Like my biological mom, she had stopped eating for a while. She wasn't really talking or working. So things got hard and I felt like, I'm going to need to drop out of school to help raise my siblings. 
So I told her that and she was like, no, you can't drop out of school. You need to get your education. If I need to get you a tutor or help you with your homework or, you know, anything, I will do my best to help, help you with whatever I can. So then from there, you know, I was like, oh, she really cares. You know, besides my grandmother, I was like, nobody really cares. Who cares what I do with my life? But Mm -hmm. she showed me that she really cares. So we became close and I would go over to her house. Um, babysit her kids she had just two at the time and they were like two and three and a half so I would babysit them and then I met her husband and he would talk to me about finances you know like okay you need to when you're working you need to save because nobody had ever taught me about that you know like for me it was just I don't know I was used to living paycheck to paycheck in Mm -hmm. my own home so I figured you know that's probably how I'll grow up to be living paycheck to paycheck but you know they taught me a lot of different things like about life and the important things about life. So, you Mm -hmm. know, I feel like God put them in my life for a reason. And now they're my mom and dad. And I am actually off of work right now due to all the COVID stuff. So I'm home living at my parents' house. So it's been great. You know, like I'm great Mm -hmm. that I have that, like that even though it was, I was 16 when I got them, I'm just very appreciative that I did Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely the hand of God. I mean, out of everyone, I'm sure you did not expect your Spanish teacher to become your mother. No. (laughs) (laughs) But I think that's just the awesome thing about God is that you don't know when he is working because we can't really always, we can't see it all the time. Um, Yes, exactly. And that's one of the biggest things that I love about your story is that there's so many, there's so many parts to it that are only because of God. Yes, it definitely is. Like from the little things that I didn't notice to big things that I did notice is literally like I look at those parts of my life and I'm like, that's because of God. Only God could have done that. Mm-hmm. God's hand was there. God protected me here. You know, like literally God's hand was over my life even before I started to live truly for him, you know, like he was always protecting me and leading me even when I wasn't taking the paths that he wanted me to take. He still made sure I was protected. Mm -hmm. So share with me, um, because I remember when I was reading your story, you were talking about how you did struggle a little bit when you were a teenager adjusting to everything and especially going to church and really committing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So another story about how I started visiting an apostolic church is one of my teachers. My world history teacher was apostolic. And growing up, you know, like I wasn't shy to different religions. Like I knew there were different religions and I knew, oh, apostolic people have long hair and they wear skirts. So I knew my teacher was apostolic and then I I was in her class when probably when I was like 15 she invited me to church so I went ended up going to church with her at a church here in Lake Charles my hometown apostolic temple of Lake Charles and I visited there and I just always felt so welcome like everyone was so kind no matter what attire I came in or how I came to church they were always so kind and I always felt God's presence there Mm -hmm. but it was like once I left you know I could still feel God's presence but I wasn't in church so I was like okay now that I'm out of church I can go hang out with my friends that are of the world also and do stuff with them you know so Mm -hmm. it was like a tug between church and the world like Wednesdays and Sundays yep I was going to go to church but then every other day of the week I was going to hang out with my friends and do what they were doing so there was still a tug on me with the world, but I knew that I loved God, but also I was like, oh, but I want to do this too. So Mm -hmm. I had to finally come to the realization that I can't ride the fence. I can't go here and then be here also. Like it was one or the other, either be hot or cold, but being lukewarm wasn't going to cut it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure those of us who have come in, in the church around that age, that's a tough age. It really is because you want to have friends. And one of the things I've been working on lately is a couple different devotionals. And one thing that God placed on my heart was, you know, we want so bad to have friends. Sometimes we do foolish things to keep them. 
Yes. Yep. Things that we know that we shouldn't even be doing, but it's like, oh, but I don't want my friend to think that I'm lame or I don't want my friend to not be my friend anymore. So why not do it? But in the end, you're hurting yourself and you are what matters in the situation, not pleasing somebody else. The only person that you should mm-hmm. be trying to please is God. Right. Right. So when you were, when you were adopted, um, how did that, how did that change? How did that change for your commitment with church? Did it, did you get better? Did it get worse? How did that transition? Um, how was that transition for you? Well, so my parents, they never officially adopted me, but they are my parents, but it wasn't, they are non-denomination. So they also go to church. So it wasn't hard because they wanted me to go to church, you know, like they knew God Mm -hmm. and they wanted me to know God and to be in God's presence. So it was like, okay, you're going to church. This is great. Keep going to church. I would go to church with them Mm -hmm. there and, or I would go to church with my other teacher to the apostolic church. And, you know, I went back and forth, but then I was still like, uh, but they always encouraged me, you know, chase after God, live for God because God, is for you and will always be for you and will never leave or forsake you. So they were always big advocates for me living for God. And that is like night and day from what yes. you were used to. Yes, it really was. So it, it was great. And also like, uh, you're, you know, like this is crazy. Yeah, I know. So now you're kind of following God and you're, you're kind of going through a new path. You're going on a new path. And then you have a major car accident. Yes. Can you explain what happens? Yeah. So I turned, okay, so I turned 19. This happened when I was 19. But when I was 18, I was telling my parents, like, I had a friend in Iowa and she was going to college there. So she was like, oh, you should move to Iowa. So when I was 18, I told my parents, like, oh, I'm going to move to Iowa. And then when I get there, I'll figure out life. Like, if I want to go to school or stuff like this, Mm -hmm. you know, and then my dad was like, no, you sound like a dumb 18 year old. It's not a plan. You can't do that. So then I was like, oh, so then I turned 19 and I, my friend, her mother was a nurse and she worked at the hospital. So I was like, do you think your mom can get me a job at the hospital? I can sign up for school. So I signed up for school online in Iowa. And then her mom got me an interview with one of her old bosses. And then we did an over the phone interview and she was like, you can have the job if you want it at St. Luke's hospital in Iowa. So then I was like, okay. So then I got all of that stuff set up and then I told my parents like, oh, I got a job in Iowa and I signed up for school. So yeah, I'm going to move to Iowa. And then my dad was like, you know, like I sound more responsible now, like I actually have a plan so you can go. So I moved to Iowa, you know, I'm 19, thinking I'm cool. Like, oh, I'm on my own, you know, like I'm living life. And then I was working full-time nights at the hospital and then I was going to school full-time during the day. So one day on my way home, I was on the highway and I was not far from home. I was probably like six minutes from home. And I guess my body knew that I was close to home. So I just fell asleep driving. And then my car veered off into like the middle meat part going towards the opposite side of the highway. So I came to like I woke up and then I saw that I was going across the highway. So I overcorrected myself and I ended up losing control of my car. and. I had hit my head really bad. So I was going back and forth through like getting CT scans and MRIs. And then my doctor had determined like I had too much fluid and stuff on my brain. So I was going to have to have surgery. So then now I'm like, oh my, oh my word, I'm 19. I can't have brain surgery. The brain is so important. What if something happens? What if I become a vegetable? Who's going to take care of me? What if I die? I haven't even lived my life yet. I just started living for God, you know, like, oh, what is happening? So I was going to church in Iowa at this time at Apostolic Assembly of Anamosa, which is my home church and where my life truly began. Mm -hmm. So there were, you know, elders in the church, her, one of the elders, her name was Gwen. She would go with me to all my doctor's appointments, like to get my CT scan and my MRIs and was there, you know, like, okay, if you have to have surgery, it'll be good. And I was always like, no, what if something happens? And she was like, oh, it'll be okay. You know, just like always reassuring of Mm -hmm. my situation. But the church prayed and I got prayed for after each scan and everything. And the Lord healed me. My last MRI, the doctor called and she was like, I don't know what happened, but 
there's nothing on your brain anymore. All your skins look amazing. So you don't have to have surgery. And I was like, <laughs> thank you, Jesus, because yeah. I was going to have to go bald and have brain surgery. And I was just not for it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, 19 years old, you you have the concept already of what it is, what yes. this surgery is and how important it is. And you know how young you are. And I can't even imagine just the fear and just the anxiety, the confusion, all of that in this situation, especially you're just starting life. You're just starting this new path. And to have this happen. Um, yes, it, I was it, like, God, I'm yes. starting. I'm sorry. I'm starting to live for you, and mm-hmm. now this happens. What is going on? <laughs> well, that's what I was gonna say. Was this definitely either this this could be the the turning point for you? Either you totally run away from him, or you just full on just run towards him. Yes, I feel like, and I truly, honestly, feel like Iowa was God moving me away from Louisiana to get me out of my comfort zone so that I could truly seek him. Like, I remember saying my Iowa days were my Job times. Literally anything that could happen to someone would happen to me. It'll be like, oh, this will happen to one in a million people. Bam, it's happening to Malika, all in (laughs) Iowa. So I was like, this is my Job time. Job still praised the Lord. Job still lived for the Lord. So why can't I, you know, everything is going bad, but that's just the devil's way of saying, I can't lose you. But I was like, I can't live for the world. So I'm going to just go ahead and go through all of these trials and tribulations and Mm -hmm. hopefully come out on top. And so far I have. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I definitely, I definitely think that's a good point is you do get to a place where you know, there's no turning back, right? Like God, anything that's in my past is in my past and I have to move forward. And especially when you start a relationship with the Lord and, um, you know, this is the beautiful thing about testimonies is hopefully this will encourage people who are in this season where they're not really sure uh, what to do. Um, If it really is just a time to just trust in God and that, you know, is he who he says he is? Is he really that good? And just hold on and wait for him to blow your mind, right? Yes, yes, truly. He truly did blow my mind in every aspect of my life from me growing up the way I did to giving me the parents I always dreamed of having to giving me the dream job that I've always wanted to just, you know, everything. Like he truly will blow your mind once you give your all to him. Yeah, for sure. So when was the turning point for you to turn to God and surrender? Was it this point? Was it the car accident or was it a different time? Um, I, so it was like a little bit before the car accident. I started, you know, like when I moved to Iowa, I was working in the counselor's office and, you know, like I, me and my friend that I had moved there for, we had stopped being friends, like. I didn't really have anyone. I met a girl in class. Her name was Mackenzie. And, you know, I was just like, I was living with my friend Allison. And then it was just like, oh, now you have to move out. So then I was like, oh, my word, what am I going to do? And I had met this friend named Mackenzie. And I had told her about my situation. And she was like, I'm going to ask my parents if you can move in with us. And I was like, oh, wait, we don't even know each other, you know. But then again, there was a hand of God. So her and her parents were like, yeah, just come move in. You'll be fine. And I had had an apartment set up to move into later on, like a few months later. So I was like, okay, I just need this amount of time until my apartment is ready. And then I can move in. My parents had told me to come back home, but I was like, I don't want to move back to Louisiana because then everybody's going to be like, you went to Iowa and couldn't survive by yourself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I was like, no, I have to stay here. I'm going to figure this out. So they were amazing people. They let me stay with them and they would have let me stay with them forever. They were like, are you sure you don't have to move to your apartment if you don't want to? But I was like, no, I need to be independent. So I ended up moving into my apartment and I was working in the office there and my now best friends, they were my best friends at the time, walked in to, they had just finished Bible college. So they were coming to sign up for classes there and I saw them and I just knew right away that they were Pentecostal. Um, just from their long hair to the way they were dressed 
and I hadn't found a home church there yet. I had visited a few apostolic churches, but I hadn't found one. And I was basing, I was basing everything off of apostolic temple here in Lake Charles, Louisiana. I was like, mm-hmm. I want to feel how I felt when I walked in there. I have to find a church like that. So I saw them and I knew they were Pentecostal. So I was like, I have to ask them what church they go to because all the churches that I've visited, I have not seen them yet. So there must be another church here. Mm -hmm. So they finished their meeting and I was like, hey, are you guys Pentecostal? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, which church do you go to? And then they told me Apostolic Assembly and, you know, they gave me a card with the times and everything. So I was like, okay, I'm going to visit. So I went and visit it and it was like this is it this is the church that I'm supposed to be at like I felt how I felt when I walked into apostolic temple like the overwhelming presence of God all of God's people being so kind and welcoming and you know just like Mm -hmm. not looking at you for the way that you look but looking at you because you are someone coming to God you know you are a soul that's going to be one to the Lord and that just always felt amazing to me like these people genuinely care about my soul, you know? So Mm. I went and visited that church and I was like, this is it. This is where I'm supposed to be. So then I kept going back. And then when I was 19, like, you know, with the car accident and everything, everybody there was so kind and so helpful. So I was like, you know, like it's time to just truly live for God. So from 19 on till now, I'm 27. I'll be 28 in a few days. I have just been pursuing God and living for him. And that's when I'm still surrendered. I love that. I love that incredible story. God just really knows what we need. And, um, and I think if we, if we just can, can continue on, right. Just have that hope. He will give us the desires of our heart. And if we just, you know, keep, just keep the faith and just keep going and not give up. I'm sure there were so many times you probably wanted to give up, but you knew that you've come so far and you weren't going to go back that you just had to keep on going. Yes. I knew that God had already blessed me so much. So why give up now? You know, like Mm -hmm. I didn't think that it was going to be easy, but I also didn't think it was going to be hard. (laughs) But when you are fighting for something that you truly want, it's not going to be easy, you know? So I just knew like, even with the bad, I'm still going to live for God because he's still going to bless me in the end. I have to keep going. I have to keep pursuing him and it'll be worth it. And for the last, what, nine years, eight and a half years, it has been worth it. Like living for him has been so worth it. That's incredible. So how have you seen the hand of God move in your life right now? Like in this season of life you're in? Oh, in this season of life that I'm in right now, (laughs) I have seen his hand in everything, literally. So I don't always see his hand right away, but I know that his hand is there. And for this season right now, I would say I'm in a season of COVID. And for that, it's so hard. It's such a big thing for me. COVID is such a big thing for me because I'm a nurse. You know, I'm Mm -hmm. one of those frontline workers. So his hand has been all over this for me just because I am not only a nurse, but I'm a traveling nurse. So I was on an assignment in Tennessee and I was there specifically to help my friend and her husband with their first child. So it was like, you know, I took an assignment there and it's going to be great. And then this pandemic happened. So my contract was supposed to end April 7th, my first contract, but I really liked that hospital and that hospital also liked me. So they were like, would you like to extend your contract and stay another three months? So I was like, yes, because I love it here and more time with the baby. So I was going to be there until like July 17th. But when all of this COVID happened, the hospital had to shut down a few floors because they weren't taking in as many patients due to all of this. So as a traveler, we cost more money. And we take jobs away from their staff. So they shut down about three floors. Each floor probably Mm -hmm. has 60 nurses. So that's like 200 and plus of their nurses that don't have jobs or have to take um, their vacation time or just be not, you know, working and getting paid. So they had to cancel all of the travelers that were there. So they were like, I'm sorry, but we have to cancel your second contract due to all of this. We really like you. We hate to do this, but we have to, you know, and I know that they didn't 
do it because they didn't like me or because they, you know, were like, oh, we have to get rid of her. It was because they had to do it so that their workers there could work. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that was a tough situation, but here is God's hand. You know, he gave me my parents that he gave me when I was 15. So now I have a home to come to. Like I can come home to my parents' house and stay with them for as long as I need to. And with all of this COVID and stuff, me, like I, my depression and anxiety was like at an all time high because I was always scared that I would be a germ. And I'm living with my friends that just had a newborn baby. What if I bring something back home from the hospital? You know, like it was just a super stressful time. And I wasn't necessarily worried about giving her anything, but I was worried about being viewed as a germ. And do they think that I'm going to harm the baby or anything like that, which they were not, you know, they were very supportive and great and knew that I wouldn't do anything to put their babies in harm way, but it was still a hard time. So, you know, I had to stop working, but God blessed me with parents that I'm able to live with and bless me with finances to the point where I can be off work for, I've been off work for a month now. So it'll be probably a total of two months that I'll be off before I start working again. But God Mm -hmm. had his hand in my life with my finances and having my dad teach me how to save and invest in all of that stuff and with giving me my parents so that I do have a roof over my head and giving me friends to encourage me during this time you know so it's been a great thing and right now that is how I'm seeing his hand in my life with protection from all of this and also like mental protection and just support from friends family and all my loved ones Mm -hmm. wow That's really amazing. I'm so glad that that worked out for you, especially during such a confusing time. Um, Yes. So let's take a minute. I really want you to take um, some time to encourage someone out there right now. Maybe this person is going through something similar or maybe they have a similar past. What is something that you wish you could tell your past self? Let's see. Okay. So. Something that I would say to try to encourage someone and that I would also tell my past self is don't go back and forth with the world and God. You know, don't wait so long because you want to live for God a little bit here, but also live for the world a little bit here. Choose God. Choose him 100% and go with him and give up the world. Life is honestly so much better with him and he can bless you so much more than you think that the world can and I do understand that some things in the world look like glitter and it looks like oh well they're not living for God but they have all of these blessings you know I just want to say one of my like one of my favorite scriptures is Proverbs 10 22 and it says that the blessings of the Lord it maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow So while it does look like the people of the world are being blessed, God's blessings are so much better and they don't have sorrow with them and they are true and they are pure. So his blessings are greater than what the world has to offer for you. And no, life won't be perfect. I remember, you know, starting to live for God and thinking like, oh, this is it. Everything's going to be good. Nope. Things for me got a lot harder And that's when the devil hits the hardest because he knows that he's going to lose a soul. He knows that if you're truly going to live for God, you're going to go 100% at it and he's going to fight and just know that fighting him is worth it. Fighting the devil to live for God is truly worth it. So I wish my younger self would have surrendered sooner and would have looked at my dark days and not dwelled on them, but looked at them and said, better days are going to come sooner than later. I know it's hard right now, but better days are coming. I just have to keep pushing and I just have to keep living for God and focusing on him and those better days will come. So just know that everything happens for a reason and I am appreciative of some of the things that I went through because it made me me and it helped me grow into I to who into who I am today. So I just hope that this encourages someone to know that no matter what your past looks like or what you look like at this moment, you can surrender to God, you can go to God, and you can live for him, and he can transform your life. No matter what others say or think about you, 
God can truly change you if you let him. Yes. Amen. Thank you so much for those words. I know that it's definitely going to bless somebody. Um, Malika, thank you so much for just opening up and being vulnerable and sharing your story. I know sometimes it's not easy, but this is kind of what, what I think some of us are called to do when we have a testimony is to share things, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's going back in the past. Well, Malika, thank you so much for opening up and being vulnerable and just sharing your story. I know it's not easy, but this is kind of what God has called us to do, you know, once he's touched our lives and, um, and you know, done a work in our life, we're supposed to be fishers of men, you know, sharing the gospel. And I think through our testimonies, we are showing the love of Jesus. And I definitely can feel that in your story and your testimony. So thank you so much. I know that God is using you. I know that he is. Um, you know, blessing those that are listening with your story right now, where can people find you on social media and connect with you? Instagram. I like to use Instagram and share stuff on there and people can message me and ask me any question that they want. I don't, I usually feel comfortable asking, answering anything. So Instagram is the best place to find me. And my name on there is Malika, but it's spelled like how you would pronounce it. So M A underscore L E I G H underscore K A. So that's where, if anybody wants to connect with me, where I can be found. Awesome. Yeah, I did see that and I thought that was very clever. It it (laughs) gives me a giggle because when I read it out, I said, Oh, that's literally her name. But yes. This is how you say my name, right? Yep, just like that, Malika. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. If you found this episode inspiring or helpful, would you take a screenshot of it and share it on your Instagram stories, tagging me at Hello Awesome Ministries? It will encourage me that you were blessed. Also, Don't forget to leave a review and subscribe so you can tune into future episodes. To learn more about Hello Awesome, head to helloawesomeministries.com. Until next time, keep your chin up, beautiful.